Why you ever chose me Has always been a mystery All my life I've been told I belong At the end of the line With all the other not quite With all the never get it right But it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all this time Cause I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Who saved my soul Ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Well, Moses had stage fright And David brought a rock to a sword fight You picked 12 outsiders Nobody would have chosen And you changed the world Well, the moral of the story is Everybody's got a purpose So when I hear that devil start talking to me Saying, who do you think you are? I say, I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody All about somebody Who saved my soul Well, ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus So let me go down, down, down in history As another blood-bought, faithful member of the family And if it all forget my name, well that's fine with me I'm living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus So let me go down, down, down in history As another blood-bought, faithful member of the family And if it all forget my name Well, that's fine with me I'm Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus I'm just a nobody Trying to tell everybody I'm all about somebody Who saved my soul Ever since you rescued me You gave my heart a song to sing Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Living for the world to see Nobody but Jesus Good morning and welcome. Welcome to worship. It's great to see everyone today. We're going to get started. We have some great worship songs today. We're going to start with House of the Lord. And the words are in your bulletin. So if everybody would like to stand, and we're going to start this worship. Come on, everyone. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, here we go. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out to the praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. My God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out to the praise. We shout out your praise. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Well, he hung up on that cross. Then he rose up from that grave. 
my God still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. My God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. We shout out your praise. Shout out to praise. We shout out to praise. We shout out to praise. Please join in singing number 13. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. in love and your slow to anger your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Oh, oh, my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I 
children to come forward, please. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? You're looking awesome. You're looking so like awake today. Everybody feeling really awake? That's great because I'm going to need your help with something in a minute. First, I got to ask you though, what are some ways that we say thank you to people? How, what are some different kinds of ways that we thank people? Yeah, you could thank them by saying, I appreciate you so much that I'm going to help you do something. Sure. What else? Right. If somebody falls down, you can help them up. What do we do to say thank you? So I, I'll give you a hint. So one of the ways we say thank you is we just say thank you with words, right? What are some other ways we might say thank you? We might say it in another language. We might for sure say it in French or Spanish or whatever language we think the people speak. We might say thank you. What about if you were at like a concert and you saw maybe you're at a band concert or orchestra or choir and the people on stage did such a good job and you want to thank them for doing such a good performance. How might, how might you say th thank you? What do we do as an audience when they give such a good job? What do you think? We might applaud. We might say thank you by applauding. Yeah. What about, um, what about if we're like, I am so grateful for this person. I want to do something extra, extra special. And it involves like maybe wrapping paper or a gift bag. What might we do to say thank you? What would we do? <clears throat> Give a... We could give them a hug. That would be hard to wrap, but we could give them a hug to say thank you. That is exactly right. What else might we do to say thank you? We could give a present to say thank you. Did you think of something else? <gasps> it's Everett's birthday. Happy birthday. That's so exciting. So I'm so thankful that you were born. We'll say thank you to God. We'll say thank you, God, for Everett, because we are so thankful that you're born. Well, today, we are celebrating all of the people who help us on Sunday mornings to learn about God, all the people who help us on Sunday evenings to learn about God, all the people who even do the behind-the-scenes work, like on the Christian Education Committee, the Youth Advisory Committee, to help us learn about God. We've got a lot of really awesome people in this church who help us to grow in knowing about God and understanding about God. And so today's a special day where we're going to say thank you to them. 
okay? So in a minute, I'm going to have them stand up right where they are, and then we're going to yell thank you. Okay, can you do that with me? All right, so out there, if you are somebody who helps on Sunday mornings teaching or Sunday evenings teaching, or you're on a committee that does stuff, or you're a youth leader, or you do Bible, you lead your Bible studies, if you could please stand up. Wow, look at all these amazing people. All right, boys and girls, on a count of three, we're going to yell thank you. One, two, three. All right, stay standing, friends, because we're also going to pray for you. So let's pray for these folks. And everybody, you can pray in your heads while I pray out loud. God, we thank you so much for all these folks who help us to know you better. We thank you for their love for you, and we pray that you would just a special blessing upon them. Bless them, keep them, and uh, strengthen them. Fill them with uh, energy to keep going. And we are so thankful for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now we are going to applaud, which is another way to say thank you. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Now, boys and girls, if you are four years old through second grade, we will meet you back in there. Otherwise, go back with your families. Please stand and join us singing Start a Fire. We need a little bit of help in the pews, pew participation today with the tapping the pews and clap. Words are in the bulletin.
us get ready for our New Testament scripture lesson that can be found on page 1,827. We are looking at Paul's letter to the Philippians, and we're looking at chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. But before we actually get into our reading, let's pause for a moment of prayer. Loving Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this chance to be in your house, this chance to have sisters and brothers in Christ around us as we go to worship and for the encouragement that we can be for one another. God, we thank you that you're a God that desires to have a relationship with us and to speak into our lives. And so we ask, God, that as we're here in your house, that you would be working through your spirit to prepare our hearts and our minds, our ears and our eyes so that we could see and hear and do the things that you would want us to do. And God, as the words of Scripture will be read and proclaimed in the sermon, may it not be my words that people hear, but may your Spirit speak through me right directly to people's hearts so they can be stirred and moved and encouraged in the faith and so that transformation can happen so that together we might be a body of Christ that is focused on you and is bringing you glory and honor as we live the ways that you would have us live. We pray this in your name, O Christ. Amen. All right, as we come to these words in Philippians that Paul is writing to the church, we can now listen to the word of the Lord as it's recorded here, Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If you have any comfort from his love, if you have any fellowship with the Spirit, if you have any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being in one spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, consider others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Recently, the NFL did something that was a little bit fun and playful. They had their schedule releases, and instead of just the NFL releasing the schedule, they said to all the different teams, you're allowed to do whatever you want, do a creative video, and then you can release your schedule out to your fans. Well, the Tennessee Titans did something that was really interesting. Okay, they said, you know what? We have all of these different opponents each week. 
And so what we're going to do is we're going to take the logos from the side of their helmets and we're going to go out to the streets. And when we're on the streets, we're going to show people this logo and see if they can identify who our opponent is. It's a really funny video on YouTube if you go and look it up. Sometimes people were kind of close and other times they were so far off identifying who these opponents were. Now, the Steelers are one of the Tennessee Titans opponents this year. So if you hear any Titans fans call them the Stars, it's because they don't know any better. Well, we're in this Armor of God series, and we've gotten to the Helmet of Salvation. And I don't think Paul was talking about a football helmet, but in reality, the football helmet has some of the same things as the Helmet of Salvation. This football helmet, right, helps identify who the players are. Well, if you've looked at a Roman helmet, it has that mohawk-looking thing on the top that's called a plume, and the color of that helped identify where you belonged in the army. This helmet helped defend the head, right, the mind, and the helmet of salvation does the same thing for us. It helps defend our minds, our thoughts, our attitudes that come from there. And this helmet of salvation also reminds us that we can identify as God's beloved children. As we look at this New, passage, New Testament passage from Acts, and we look at what Paul was writing to the Philippians, it speaks to this, this helmet of truth. It gives us, or helmet of salvation. It gives us four truths that we have there. And as we're looking through the rest of the passage, it can be encouraging and it can be a challenge. Listen to these four truths. And the way that Paul did this is it's a rhetorical sort of question, right? So he says, if you have experienced any of this, and he's expecting you to say, yes, I've experienced. Listen to this. Any encouragement from Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion. So as we think about those four things, I think about the first one, and I'm hoping for you that first one is true, that you can reflect and say, I have been encouraged by Christ because it's Christ who comes alongside me and walks with me throughout life, spurs on my faith, gives me strength to make it through the day. My hope is that you can also say that you have gotten this, this love. You understand the love that God has for you, right? The Lord of the universe chooses you and chose to step out of heaven because of that love that he has for you. So I hope that love is a comfort to you. As we think about this fellowship with the Spirit, right? We had that whole series just previously where we were talking about the fruits of of the Spirit. And as we think about it, we realize God has given us the Holy Spirit. And this Holy Spirit works in and through us and brings about growth when we see that in the fruits of the Spirit. And as we get to the last one, it's talking about this compassion and tenderness that God has for us. And we read scriptures that talk about God being like the mother hen who covers the chicks with her wing. And we realize that Christ has done the ultimate compassionate act for us, laying down his very life, so that instead of us receiving death that we were due, we were able to have life because of that. And so I hope as you think about these four different truths, it, it encourages you, you Walk in a way that you realize that you know that and those things are in your head and secure. This passage, however, can also be a challenge, especially if we aren't taking it in the context that it was meant to be taken. It can cause us some worry and anxiety. But it can be a challenge and a rallying call to live out our faith even better. So we get to the beginning, right? And what's happening after these truths? 
Paul's saying, hey, you've got to live in this way where you're not living out of selfish ambitions. And he, he lays out some stuff. We can probably do that. We can live into that. But then he says, oh, actually, your attitude has to be the same as Christ Jesus. And that's when it gets a little bit more like, uh-oh. And then we get the hymn. And he talks about all these great things that Christ has done for us. And has done for the world. And by the end of that, man, that feels like a large weight that we could never live up to. Right? And then we get to verse 12. In verse 12, Paul tells us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. And I imagine when we get to this point and we're thinking, oh, man, I'm in trouble. It can be a lot like Isaiah experienced when he came into God's presence. And so I encourage you to go look up Isaiah 6 later and you can see kind of the whole story. But the short version of it is Isaiah comes in and fully sees God's presence and he goes, man, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. He's thinking, I can't do anything here. And the truth is that on our own, we can't do anything. Just like Isaiah was considered unworthy then, we are considered unworthy. It's why when we have the prayer of confession sometimes in this worship service, it should be really easy to say, okay, I need to say this. Because we realize that on our own, left up to our own devices, we can't live perfectly. We are in need of God's grace. One person put this once, and it's stuck with me since then. He said, earning our salvation through works alone would be like if we were able to long jump over the Grand Canyon. It's an impossible act. It can't be done. But luckily for us, that isn't the end of the story. Our salvation and earning is not left to us alone. What happens in the Isaiah passage, if you remember it? An angel comes, has taken a coal from God's altar and touches it to Isaiah's lips and says, your guilt has been atoned for. What does this foreshadow for us? The cross, where Christ died on our behalf, taking on our sin and punishment so that we could receive forgiveness. And even verse 12 isn't the end of our Philippians passage. We get to the very next verse, and it helps put things in a proper perspective for us. As it says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. And so what this verse does is it helps put things in that right perspective, realizing that it's not our works that it's God's works and what God has done for us that has earned us this salvation. A salvation that we can be assured of, a salvation that is secure. So what does Paul mean by this verse? He puts work out your salvation. And so what is he talking about? I don't think he's trying to cause us anxiety there that somehow we have to do it on our own. But I think what he's trying to get to is this mindset change that we need to have in our attitude. And that's what this helmet is help protecting so that we can have this good mindset. We just had some kids up for the children's sermon. And as you think about kids, what's one of the first things that you think about? Man, they're innocent, right? They're like perfect little angels, well, if you've been around a kid enough, you know that although there is some definite innocence with a little child, the reality is that even a little child is broken like us. They do stuff out of selfish ambition, and it's that selfish ambition that can lead to sin. And so we've got a real problem. We need a transformation of that selfish mindset. And that's what this helmet of salvation can do as Christ works in us, making so that it's not just our ways that we're thinking about, but that we're moving to thinking about God's ways. 
Now, this sermon could go on and on in all of the different ways that God brings about transformation and that sort of stuff. But what I wanted to do today was just look at one way. And this way that God brings about transformation in us as we embrace the questions that we have about faith. And I thought it was really fitting to think about this as today we're also honoring all of the people that Karen talked about, those people that have been Sunday school teachers and youth leaders and help lead Bible studies and are thinking behind the scenes and setting it up, all so that we can have this renewal of our minds, so that we can be thinking about theology and what it means for our faith and then are encouraged in our journey. So the reality is sometimes in your faith, you're going to have questions, you're going to have doubts. And you've got two options when that happens. The first option is to completely be like, oh, I really shouldn't be thinking about that and just try to ignore it and bottle it up inside. I don't think that's going to lead to good results at all. Or you can say, hey, I am secure in my salvation. God is big enough for my questions. And you can start asking questions and then God meets you there and growth happens. So sometimes we can be in this unhealthy spot, though, where we can be going down thoughts that, that aren't great, where we can think, man, I, I'm not really worthy. I'm not enough. How could God love someone like me? And when we're in those places, if we come across a scripture like it's uh, Hebrews 6, or chapter 6, verse 4 through 6, it can leave us in this feeling of anxiousness, fear, anxiety, because this is what Hebrews 6 verses 4 through 6 says, It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, in other words, once saved salvation, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age, if they are to fall away, to be brought back to repentance. Saying if you fall away, you, you can't come back. Because to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. And so if you just read these words and you don't understand the context and you don't start asking questions, this passage can cause a lot of fear and anxiety. But as you start asking questions about the passage, as you start studying Scripture, putting it in its proper context, you can realize, actually, this is a huge encouragement to me because I realize what Christ has done for me. It isn't the case that if I've once been a Christian and I've messed up, that somehow it's all lost. No, that's never the case. And before I even talk about this Hebrews passage, let's just think about that line of reasoning there alone. Right? What was I just saying at the beginning? Whose work is it that earned our salvation? Christ's work. So if Christ is the one that earned our salvation, how after we've been saved does it come back on our work? It's just wrong thinking. It's always Christ's work in us that earns us this ability to have salvation. And so what is happening with this Hebrews passage? Because it sure makes it seem like it's works-based. Well, if you know what the book of Hebrews is about, it's written to Jews. It's written to Jews trying to point out how Christ is superior to the ways that they've been living and fulfills all of this stuff. So what did Jews do when they sinned? They came to the temple. They had to give a sacrifice, right? Well, how often would we have to end up at the temple? All the time, right? Because we mess up pretty regularly. And so what the author of Hebrews is saying here is, yeah, if you want to move away from the way that Christ has earned you salvation and you want to take on that sacrificial thing, yeah, you're in trouble. That's a way that's going to lead to death. And so therefore, embrace and trust that Christ has done the work for you. Your salvation is secure because of what he's done for you once and for all. So as we think about what Christ has done for us once and for all, we realize this new identity that we've been given as God's beloved children. We hopefully have this helmet on that's reminding us that it's not about our works that earns us salvation, but that it's Christ's works. We realize we've been given this Holy Spirit that works in and through us and brings about 
transformation in our lives, in the ways that we think, in the ways that we act. We realize with this helmet of salvation on, that it's speaking about the Holy Spirit that's in us, that seals and marks us as Christ's own forever because he died for us and we're connected to him in baptism. So we can realize all of this incredible work that's been done for us. And so the question is, is there any work for us? And I think the work for us is the work of a response. To realize all of the incredible things that Christ has done for us and then try to live in the best way we can so that we can point others back to Christ so they can realize the incredible gift that they have been given. At the end of the day, the reality is that God is always faithful so our salvation can be secure even when we aren't faithful. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. We recognize that you have already proven yourself victorious over all things that could separate us. For there is nothing that can separate us from your love. And we thank you for that reality. For as your son who proved that to us and he came and revealed that depth of love and compassion, care. And so even now as faithful disciples, we join our voices with all those who have gone on before us to recite the words of a prayer that you have taught us to pray and recognizes our unity one with another and one with you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, recognizing that we have a great joy and a great responsibility to come before the presence of God to return that which he has graciously given to us, even as that you know, small portion that reflects our gratitude, let us now receive our tithes and our offerings. Let's pray. Lord, with these gifts, we thank you that you have bestowed your blessing upon us, that we live where we live. We have homes that we have and cars that actually work most of the time. We thank you for that. And so all these things we recognize are gifts from you and even now these that we give to advance the work of this church and the impact that it has in the community and the globe. We ask your blessing upon that that those who don't have access to vehicles or access to safe homes would then equally be able to share in that uh, exp ex expression of praise. For you are the one in whom we trust. It's in your son's precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Praise to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our God and our King. To Him we will sing. In His great mercy He has given us life. Now we can be called the children of God. Great is the love that the Father has given us. He has delivered us. He has delivered us. Children of God, sing your song and rejoice for the love that He has given us. So, oh, oh, children of God, by the blood of His Son, we have been redeemed and we can be called children of. to 
mystery is revealed to the universe. The Father above has proven his love. Now we are free from the judgment that we deserve. And so we are called the children of God. Great is the love that the Father has given us. Well, he has delivered us. Well, he has delivered us. Children of God, sing your song and rejoice. For the love that He has given us all. Wow, wow, children of God, by the blood of His Son, we have been redeemed and we can be called children of God. The children of God. saints we are the children we've been redeemed we've been forgiven we are the sons and the daughters of our god we are the saints we are the children we've been redeemed we've been forgiven we are the sons and the daughters of our god children of god sing your song and rejoice for the love that he has given
singing Open Up the Heavens, found at number 79 in your book. We've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire. We'll burn our hearts with truth. I wanted to remind you of some words that Tim Keller would have said often that have encouraged me that I hope encourage you. He would say that we are more sinful and broken than we ever want to believe. Yet at the same time, we are more loved and accepted by Jesus Christ than we could have ever hoped. So take those words as you go and realize the truth that's in them. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you now and forevermore. And may he grant you his grace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Oh, 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 oh. 
we've waited for this day. We're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire, will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. 